One of those chips is fake. Can you spot it? This time things are more complicated because the fake chip passes a lot of the tests, yet it makes the Commodore 64 not work properly. Get ready for a journey of discovery involving mains frequency, trigger levels, and fake Chinese chips. Again. Hello and welcome back to Noel's Retro Lab. A few episodes ago I fixed this Commodore 64 replica board or at least I thought I had fixed it. When I was doing the last diagnostics pass with the full test harness, I got those errors. You can ignore the cassette port error because it was just a matter of cleaning the edge connector with alcohol or maybe just pushing in the adapter all the way. The strange ones are the CIA errors. CIA stands for Complex Interface Adapter, and they're in charge of Parallel I.O. through the user port, Serial I.O. through the IEC port, which is the serial port, interval timers that can raise interrupts, and the time of day clock, which is clearly only active when they're powered, so in practice it would reset every time the Commodore was turned off and on. There are a couple of reasons those errors are strange. First of all, the CIAs are marked as bad, but the things that depend on the CIA functionality, like interrupts or reading the user port, are all working as evidenced by the tests. They are all marked as passing. In that case, what exactly is failing in the CIAs? Fortunately, we have a big hint of what's happening right here in front of your eyes. Don't feel bad if you're not seeing it. I didn't at first, until Michael Durnboss pointed it out to me on the Discord server after seeing the screenshots of this test. The running time at the bottom of the screen is always zero. I totally didn't catch that. Actually, I didn't realize that on a working C64, that time moves forward, but it does. So that is a great starting point. Pin 19 of the CIA is for the time of day signal. There, it expects to get a periodic signal to update the internal time. And where does the Commodore 64 get that signal from? The AC voltage from the power supply. If you're anything like me, you'll probably be pretty surprised to hear that the Commodore 64 is designed to use the frequency of the mains voltage to drive its clock. Without knowing the specifics, that sounded extremely inaccurate to me, but is it really? It turns out that the mains frequency is not nearly as bad as I envisioned it. It does have some variation built in, but apparently it's pretty stable on average in the long term. It seems that this is a common way to drive wall clocks powered by AC voltages, so clearly it can be that bad. And in the end, how accurate does the time of day clock need to be on the C64? I don't even know that it has any real important uses since the time goes away every time you reset the computer, so maybe to show how long you've been playing a game or using some program, but that's about it. The thing that surprises me is that already having clock signals with frequencies around 1 MHz, that they didn't design the time of the feature to run off of that. Maybe it would have required a couple extra registers to deal with a higher clock frequency, and that was impossible to fit in the CIA. But anyway, let's go ahead and see if that's the problem we're having here. So to test that theory, let's look at the signal on pin 19 of the CIAs. That's supposed to be this signal that comes from the power supply, and it's about 50 or 60 hertz, that advances the timer on the CIAs. So that's pin 19, and we get, yeah, we get ground. It should be the same in both of them because they're connected. Yeah, so we're definitely not getting any kind of square wave signal or even like a sine wave signal in there. Let's follow that lead. Looking at the circuit diagram, there's some processing applied to the AC voltage from the mains. It may look a bit intimidating at first, but let's have a look at what's happening and make sense out of it since this is going to be important to understand the problem. The first important element is the Zener diode CR1. Normal diodes are designed to let current flow in one direction, but not in the other. Zener diodes are special in that they have a specific voltage beyond which the current will also flow backwards. In this case, the voltage is even listed in the schematic, 2.7 volts. That means that any voltage over that value will cause the current to flow to ground and the voltage will stay at 2.7 volts, which means that if the input is a sine wave from 0 to 9 volts, the output is something like this, cut off at 2.7 volts, or at least in theory. Afterwards, we have an AND gate. We're ending the cutoff sine wave with 5 volts. So the idea is that when the input signal is high, the output will be high. And when the input is low, the output will also be low. The whole reason to send it through an AND gate is to get a nice square signal out of the other end. Finally, the other important element is resistor R37. 
that will act as a positive feedback loop or hysteresis. Whenever the output is low, it's going to push the input low a bit, and whenever it's high, it's going to push the input high. In other words, it's going to push the input away from the middle, which would cause the gate to flicker back and forth many times and prevent things from working correctly. And that's it. It's not so complicated now, right? So now let's look at it working in practice. So the output of the AND gate should be here. And yeah, that is ground. And then the inputs are, there you go. That's the alternating current. So that's exactly 50 hertz, okay. And the other input is five volts. So yeah, clearly when we have the AND of this, although you know what, maybe the gate is fine, but the amplitude of that is not enough to ever register as a logical high. That could be it as well. Interesting. So yeah, we need to track down where exactly this is coming from. So this is the circuit here that takes care of converting the AC voltage from the power supply into something that gets sent to the AND gate. So backtracking, this is what's being sent to the AND gate. And yeah, I mean, that doesn't go over 2 volts. And interestingly, it goes below zero volts. I'm not sure that's supposed to be that way. And this is before the resistor. So this is right where the diode is. And this is a Zener 2.7 volt diode. And as you can see, the cutoff is exactly 1, 2.7. So that is working really well. And before the diode, I need to go back to this one. Before the diode, it's a very similar signal, but it just keeps going. And after the resistor and the diode, it, diode, it just cuts it up. But the fact of the matter is, by the time it gets to the AND gate, this is just two volts. And that might not be enough to trigger a high voltage level. These kind of computers usually run voltage levels between zero and five volts. It's pretty clear that if you have a signal that is 5 volts, it will be considered a logical high, and a signal that is 0 volts, a logical low. But what happens if the signal is 2 volts, or 3 volts, or 4 volts? That's when we need to look at the exact kind of technology the gates use. One common kind of technology is called TTL, which stands for transistor-transistor logic. This is the technology that was most common in 80s computers like the Commodore 64. With TTL chips, the range for input low logic levels is from 0 to 0 0.8 volts, and high logic levels from 2 volts to 5 volts. Output logic levels are a bit different, but we're not going to get into that right now. Logic chips of the 74000 series, like this AND gate, are labeled based on the technology that is used to implement them. In particular, TTL technology is identified as LS, and that's why the chip that is here is a 74LS08. So based on that, the 2 volts we're seeing on the AND gate should be enough to trigger it and set the output to 1. In that case, it's likely that the chip itself is faulty. To find out, let's pop it into my EEPROM programmer, which is also able to test several common logic chips. We select 7804, quad AND gate, and it passes. So it seems that the chip is working correctly. How is that possible? Maybe the chip is perfectly fine and there's something on the board preventing it from working correctly. So this is another board of the exact same revision as our 60 clone board. They're both identical. And I'm going to try using the AND gate that we have here at U27. And this is, let's just make sure. Yeah, this is also a 24 ls08 so let's use that one because i know this one is working so let's see if that chip works on our clone board okay so this is before going into the um into the and gate and this is coming out of the and gate so that is working correctly this chip is working perfectly fine so the board is working fine but not with the original chip what could be happening there's another common technology type called CMOS, which stands for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor. Without getting in details, it uses different kinds of transistors to implement the same kind of circuits as TTL, but there are a few differences. Apart from being less noisy, being able to be more densely packed, and consuming less power, the input levels of CMOS logic chips are different from the TTL ones. Logic low level ranges from 0 volts all the way up to 1.5 volts, but 
Most importantly, logic high levels only start at 3.5 volts and go all the way to 5 volts. Clearly, an AND gate implemented that way would not work at all in our circuit. CMOS logic chips are identified with the letters HC, so a CMOS quad AND gate would be a 74HC08. I'm going back to the fact that maybe this is not a real LS chip. Let's run some tests on it. But actually before that, and just for fun, let's see how an HC chip, so CMOS chip, is not going to work. So this is a 74HC08. This is before the AND gate, and this is after the AND gate. And of course, it stays at zero. Yeah, so those two volts are definitely not enough to trigger a CMOS logic chip. So let's go ahead and test our 74 logic and make sure that it's LS and not HC. So for now, I'm starting with the HC one, just to have a, a, a point of reference. So what I've done is just a very simple circuit. I've ha I have five volts and ground coming in here, and then I have an adjustable 10K resistor with like, I don't know what that is, like one or one and a half K resistor there. So this lets me vary the voltage of this signal between um, zero and if when this resistance goes to zero up to like 4.5 volts or something like that and we're going to do something very similar to the ways hooked up on the Commodore 64 so we're going in this same gate and one of the inputs of the gate is tied to 5 volts and then we are looking in one channel at the input into that gate and the other channel the green cable is the output and so let's look at it on the oscilloscope right now so right now I've offset things a little bit, so I'm at one volt per square, just to be able to really see the difference. So this is zero volts right now. And as I move this, I, I am moving the input into that gate. So as you can see, I'm going up to there and nothing happens. And then eventually I go sufficiently high and then the output jumps to five volts. Great. So the question is, where does that happen? So we're at three. Remember, this was zero. We're at three. Then as we go down, boom, we get a bunch of noise and flipping back and forth. And then we're at zero. So that seemed to happen. Yeah, look at that. At two volts is not happening. It's two and a half. Yeah, about two and a half is when this is triggered. So that is pretty good for an HC gate. I think they're not supposed to trigger until three and a half. Anything else is, in, they, don't, they don't make any guarantees, but this one particularly does trigger that low. So that's pretty good, but clearly at two, which is what our circuit was doing, or even I'm a, a little over two right there, it's not good enough. Now let's see what the working LS chip does. That's the one that we got from the Commodore 64 that was working. So we're at ground, and then I start going up. Oh, look at that, it jumped. Wow, so it really is triggered at slightly over one volt. Yeah, one, one and a half, two, so all of this, and it just triggers. It needs to be a little over one. It looks like it's like 1.1 or 1.2 that triggers it. So now let's put the chip that we had in the computer, the one that Damien has selected, correctly as 74LS, but let's see if it really behaves like a 74 LS. Look at that, two to something. It doesn't trigger, it doesn't trigger until three. I mean, it triggers exactly like the HC one. So, you know what? I think this is a case of a rebranded logic chip, which is just amazing that they would do that for this kind of Chip. I mean, these are dirt, dirt cheap. So it's incredible that they're taking the effort to do that. But it clearly is triggering just like the other one at about actually even higher than two and a half. So yeah, there's no way this is going to work with that. So this clearly does not behave like an LS chip. So has it been rebadged or relabeled? And you know, I don't think so. There's we have those dips in there from the manufacturing process and usually if the chip has been sanded down you can tell but they seem to have some depth to them so that seems fine 
and the chip looks fine otherwise. One thing that looks weird is that when I looked on the internet for other 74LS08 chips, the label on them looked pretty different and pretty different in not just like the numbers were different, but for example, it seemed to be, all the letters seemed to be much smaller and towards the center. These seem to be much wider letters. And even this logo on the side looks a little weird. So that could mean they're counterfeit. Let's try applying some alcohol and acetone since that seems to help find out at least the ones that have been sanded down and repainted on top. And that seems fine. And what about some acetone? That also seems fine. Although, you know, now that I look at it, those letters are significantly dimmer now than they were before. And yeah, I guess looking at the two of them after applying the acetone, those letters definitely went away quite a bit. But, you know, does that mean it's not a, a legit chip? I mean, we know that inside is not, but has this been changed? I don't know. I mean, it could just be a the type of manufacturing process they do for that. So I, I would say the alcohol and the acetone are inconclusive. But the tests that we did inside, those are very, very clear that this is not a 74LSOE chip. So what is going on in here? I have no doubt that this is not an LS chip. And in case this was an isolated occurrence, I asked Damien to send me the rest of the chips he got with that batch and they all behave the same way. On the other hand, it doesn't feel rebatched. The surface is fine. It doesn't feel like it's been sanded down and relabeled. So it's not the same kind of a scam as what they do with more expensive chips, which makes sense because each of these chips is probably worth just a couple of cents. One possible theory is that these chips were manufactured this way. Maybe the factory is only set up to create CMOS chips and they label these as LS. And why would they do such a thing? After all, TTL logic chips tend to be worse performing than CMOS ones because they know that some people like me or you are specifically looking for the LS versions of these chips to repair all devices. And in the large majority of the cases, they'll work just fine. So they're getting extra sales purely based on the label they're slapping on them. I have read similar things happening with some diode models, so this is unfortunately already happening with other components. The only weird thing about this is that the manufacturing plant could have used HCT logic chips, which use CMOS technology, but have input voltage levels comparable to TTL devices, so you probably wouldn't notice that they're not TTL. But I guess if you're running a quick scam, you might not even care to do it correctly. So clearly to fix this, we just need to put a true 74LS08 in here. Unfortunately, I don't have any spare ones, but really the HC logic family, it's actually better than the LS for most intents and purposes. So maybe we can modify this circuit just a little bit so it works with an HC chip. And for that, what I was thinking is changing the Zener diode. This Zener diode has a reverse voltage of uh, 2.7 is designed that way. So, and I have one with me right here. I don't have that many, but I have one right here that whose reverse voltage is 3.3. That might be enough to trigger the HC chip. So let's give it that a try. Okay, there it is. So to test this, I'm going to do it without the AND gate and without the CIA chips. That way I can look at the voltage and make sure it's okay. I mean, maybe I had this diode mislabeled and it's going to put some really high voltage since we're feeding it nine volts AC. So I'm just being extra cautious. Okay, let's try the voltage with the new Zener. And that seems to go higher. Right, so that's two volts, two, yeah, it's hitting three something. Okay, I, I, I'm hopeful that it might work even with the HC chip. Okay, so I'm putting the HC chip. I'm still not putting the CIAs just in case. When I'm putting something that wasn't intended in the circuit, I'm trying to be super extra cautious and this is not even mine. So I, I don't want to ruin it. So now we have that in the input and the output. Ah, it's still not enough to trigger it. Oh, what a bummer. Yeah, the input, it's almost there. 
It's a little bit more than before. He goes over two. But yeah, it's probably just missing almost nothing. You know what? This is with this one. Let me put my HC one, which seemed to trigger just a little lower than that one. All right, let's try with that one. Input, okay, output. Check that out. That was just enough to have this one trigger, but not the other one. And you know what? This is better because at least here, it's clear for the future that we're not lying. This is an HC chip, it's not an LS one. So, wow, that's awesome. Okay, let's put the CIs back together and run the full test, and I'm hopeful that it will all work now. All right, with everything connected, let's try it again. Okay, and this is where before it would have given us the error on um, the CIA. So it's all looking good. And notice we have the time, not the correct time, but time is passing. So that's what we fixed with that chip. Fantastic. And so here's the board with the final touches. There's a couple things that I did. I changed the capacitor, the tantalum capacitor. A lot of you told me last video that after it had the reverse voltage applied to it, that it was probably faulty and maybe it could even fail in spectacular ways. So I just changed the other thing and have another tantalum one. So I use an electrolytic one, which for this should be totally fine. And yes, the polarity is set correctly. And I also got rid of this ugly cable that I had before for the five volts for the composite out um, add-on. And I just decided to use a much smaller cable, getting five volts from the cartridge connector. It really didn't make a difference in the image quality, getting it from here or from here. So that is just a lot neater. So yeah, this is great. It looks beautiful and it works just like a regular Commodore 64. So mission accomplished. So there you have it. Fake chips strike again. Although this time it looks like they may be coming straight from the factory, which in a way it's kind of scarier. If you have some specific information about that, let me know in the comments. I still have to do a follow-up video on the fake VDPs one, opening up the chips and comparing their content. So the more information I gather about this, the better. Anyway, at least we got the replica board fully functional. The thing that is missing is using all modern replacement chips for the custom CMOS ones. I'm currently working on a comparison of modern SID replacements, so that should be coming soon. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the episode and I'll see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Noel's Retro Lab on Patreon or joining the membership on YouTube. Not only is that the best way to support this channel and allow me to continue making more videos, but you also get some extra perks like early access, ad-free videos, and more. Thank you again to all the supporters. See you next time.